been a standing ovation before the film. <laughs> um, uh, I just want to say thanks to Projecting Change for inviting the film and for inviting Paul. There's a few people who worked on the film. Um, this film took close to uh, almost 10 years to make. So there's a few people here that I really want to thank. Brendan Willard, who edited the film. who went to the Antarctic aboard the ship and filmed is also here. Uh, and there's numerous people here who were in the film um, who allowed me to interview them and I really want to thank them. I need to thank uh, E1 uh, Films, uh, Telefilm Canada and the Rogers Documentary Fund for finally uh, coming through with the money to help make the film. And then most of all, I really want to thank Paul for letting me uh, follow him around the world uh, for years and years and years, uh, promising to eventually finish the film. So we have a special presentation. I don't know if Paul, you want to say something before we do that, but. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so one of the things that just happened before the film is uh, two young kids just came over to a cafe that it, they arranged to meet Paul, and I thought it was really a reflection of what this festival is. And they have a wonderful story, but they've raised a bunch of money for Sea Shepherd in honor of their sister, who recently passed away. So Cody and Katie, why don't you come up and make this I'm, my name's Cody, and this is my sister Katie. Uh, on August 24th of 2010, our sister was killed in a car accident. And one of her biggest dreams after watching uh, the show Whale Wars on Animal Planet was to eventually be on that show and do something that she thought was a great cause. Unfortunately, she'll never get to live that, but we thought that we could make it so she could live that through us. And that's why we worked uh, hard for the past nine months to raise $12,500. And we're gonna continue to raise money in her honor. And Tommy, can you stand up please? He will be selling some bracelets after the show because unfortunately me and my sister can't stay. So we have these wonderful bracelets, kind of like Livestrong bracelets, that we sell for a donation of however much you, you feel is appropriate. And we'd like to present Paul with the money. <laughs> It's been a great honor to actually be able to interview some of the giants of the environmental movement. Obviously, Paul, but uh, Paul Spong, Rex Weiler, all these people who 
you know, created incredible change starting in the 60s and 70s. And um, one of the greatest moments for me was being on the ship, and it really dawned on me when we were patrolling the Galapagos that the oceans are a vast place, and I think because humans are land mammals, we tend to think that people are following regulations, and it's like a light bulb going on, uh, knowing that they're pretty lawless, and Paul is a unique individual in the world doing the work he does, so thanks, Paul. Just wanted to update. Um, this year we went back down with three ships, and uh, this was our most effective year ever. The Japanese whaling fleet took only 15% of their quota. And, uh, we left a month and a half earlier than expected, and uh, I don't think they're going to come back. If they do, we'll be back there waiting for them. Uh, meanwhile, the Steve Irwin and uh, is in southern France. We replaced the Adagil with the uh, a new vessel, which we named Gojira, which means Godzilla. Uh, Godzilla actually, Gojira means in Japanese gorilla whale, so we thought it was quite appropriate. I just couldn't resist the headlines of Godzilla chases whaling fleet out of. I don't know. In Japan, of course, Gojira in Japan has a completely different meaning. But uh, unfortunately, the only thing more frightening than Godzilla is Godzilla's lawyers. <laughs> and so we were told we couldn't use the name, but that's okay, it fulfilled its function. And then two days ago, we just renamed the vessel, so it's now the Bridget Bardot, and uh, gave us a terrific media coverage in France there two days ago. Uh, so the Bridget Bardot is with the Steve Irwin in Toulon, and uh, in a couple of days, uh, we'll be leaving to go to the coast of Libya. And the reason being is that uh, the poachers are going to take advantage of the war zone and the EU has assured us that any fishing vessel we find in that zone, we can cut their nets and free the fish. That any fishing vessel we find. Last year we uh, cut the nets and released 800 uh, tuna. And when people are concerned about our safety this year, it's much safer this year than it was last year. First of all, no Libyan Air Force. Second of all, no Libyan Navy. Uh, we just have to worry about friendly fire from NATO, but we'll keep them advised as to where we are. Uh, and right after that, we will be um, taking the vessels to the International Whaling Commission meeting this year, which is in July, and it's being held in Jersey, in the Isle of Jersey. And then from there, we'll be going up to the Danish Faroe Islands to interfere with the killing of pilot whales there. Also, uh, we've had a crew in Japan for the last six months, and they succeeded in cutting the dolphin kill uh, quota by half, 800 dolphins. were killed, but every year it's usually about 16 to 1800. So, you know, it, but that was a six month crew on the ground for six months. And in fact, we almost lost them because on March, uh, uh, I think the 12th, the, uh, our crew were in of all the, day, all the days to go to the northern, northern part of the island to check out uh, dolphin killing. Uh, they were in Iwate Prefecture when uh, our crew leader noticed the water being sucked out of the harbor and they got up on top of a hill just in time and nine minutes later the tsunami wiped out that entire town and we lost them for about 40 hours but uh, in a true sea shepherd fashion uh, the next morning they commandeered a Japanese fire truck and drove their way down the hill. <laughs> um, but uh, unfortunately Japan has a uh, it treats us really as like, it's almost an honor really, they treat us like we're a foreign nation that they're at war with. And uh, they've, put in, they've been putting a lot of pressure on it. I'm now officially, by the way, on the um, Interpol blue list. What that means is I'm not wanted for anything, but people are instructed to give me a hard time when I cross borders. <laughs> and I first learned about this uh, when I drove from here down to Washington. And I happen to hold both passports, so they can't keep me out of the U.S., can't keep me out of Canada, much of the frustration in both countries. But as I drove down across the border, I just calmly handed my passport over, not suspecting anything, and suddenly the officer said, put your hand on the wheel now, sir. And all of a sudden, sirens started going off, and my hands were on the wheel, and I noticed that there were guys behind concrete blocks with guns aimed at me. And 
And uh, they said, throw out your keys. Well, I can't throw out my keys with my hands on the wheel. So uh, then he got me out of the car, handcuffed me, threw me in, and 10 minutes later I was on my way. Because apparently there's no warrant for my arrest. Just, But what I found out is that I'm on the document as armed and dangerous eco-terrorist. <laughs> What we managed to do, I've managed to make this work for me now, so that uh, just yesterday coming into Chicago, we, we call ahead now and everything gets cleared, but I'm met at the airport by the Homeland Security guys, who I know now and very friendly, and they escort me right to the front of the line and out the door. I'm, for the, I'm, I'm out there before everybody else, so I'm getting the VIP, I call it the blue list um, VIP treatment, and so very thankful to Japan for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, hopefully we won't have to go back and we're actually making other progress right after that I was uh, invited by the president to Palau to come visit him in March and uh, we were requested if we could help them and so we said yeah we'll provide our vessel to Bob Barker we'll take it and send it to Palau to police their waters because all of these island nations are getting just completely plundered by illegal fishing operations there's more illegal fishing in the world now than there is legal fishing and uh, so we agreed and we signed a contract with the Palau government uh, to officially police their waters. Well, Japan found out about that. They sent a delegation, despite the earthquake and the tsunami, they still sent a delegation down there to demand that Palau not work with us. And of course the president didn't give in on this, but then uh, they said, well, we'll give you a patrol boat and the money to run it. And so the president called me and said, well, take the patrol boat and take the money. That's great. You know, so what he did, and now we're going to Nauru and the Cook Islands and the Marshall Islands. I think we can get Japan to provide patrol boats to everybody. <laughs> so thank you. It, it, we'd be very pleased to answer any, any questions anybody has. How is that going to work this way? All right, uh, questions right here. Thank you for your remarkable work. I wonder how we can use some of the same techniques you used for marine mammals to protect all species in global warming. What kinds of um, exciting, important, revolutionary techniques do you think we can use there? I think that really what you need to concentrate on is that the solution to all these problems lies in the passion, the courage, and the imagination of individuals. And um, not to depend on governments, they never solve problems, they cause problems. Uh, but to depend upon the, the, that, that kind of passion. And just imagination is really the way to find out about it, or, or to find these solutions. When people say that, uh, you know, oh, it's so overwhelming, I mean, what can we do? I mean, it's impossible. Well, I think that the uh, answer is always the impossible one. You just have to be able to visualize that answer. For instance, in 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible, yet it happened. So I think we can solve these problems, and that's why I take a, an optimistic uh, outlook on this. Next question. In the film, you said uh, there was a question of your retiring. Um, what, what, what's your comment on that? Uh, well, first of all, I've never, ever believed in retirement. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father died at 96, uh, and he was murdered. So, <laughs> he was working till the day he died. He still managed to wound the guy enough that he was arrested. So, uh, the I don't believe in retirement, and uh, I don't intend to retire. In fact, I'm quite enjoying what I'm doing. And I don't know, is it, people seem to think I'm getting old or something. That question keeps coming up all the time. I'm not that old. I'm the youngest, youngest founding member of Greenpeace. How old are you? Well, <laughs> I, in December, I turned 16. He won't retire. I, having been on the ship, I don't think Paul will ever retire. December what? <laughs> Second. In the year 2000, when the tsunami hit uh, Southeast Asia, the Canadian government financed the rebuilding of fish boats in Sri Lanka. And uh, the Canadian press, when the 
the tsunami hit Japan a couple of months ago, it was considered to be unethical to raise the issue that this was uh, a, a some kind of karma that uh, uh, was due to them. Maybe you'd like to comment on that. Oh no, the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan were not karma. It's a, it's a question of geography and geology. And uh, so I, I actually get very upset when people say the Japanese deserve this. It's not the Japanese people. It's just like, you know, you and I are not responsible for the seal hunt as Canadians, just as the average Japanese is not responsible for the killing of whales and the killing of dolphins. It's a certain segment of, uh, of these societies. And ultimately it falls on the government. Uh, in this country, the single most corrupt and probably uh, ridiculous bureaucracy in this country is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. They are totally uh, incompetent. They, they destroyed the cod fishery on the East Coast and they will wipe out the salmon on the West Coast. These people are environmental criminals and you know they're always saying, oh, well, we have the best scientists in the world. You know, they have the best biostitutes in the world. These are people who come up with the scientific justifications for their political policies. And that, uh, you know, and they're, they're wrong. They've been wrong consistently. Well, you know, I hate to say that. As long as this country keeps voting for assholes like David, uh, Stephen Harper, That man isn't an ecological criminal. You know today that we dropped 200, $100,000 bombs on Libya? What the hell is Canada thinking? Any more questions? Let's follow that one. Let's get it. Actually, no, I'm going to do you first. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, I would like to just preface this real fast. I ran for the Pirate Party Canada in Vancouver Center during this last election, and I was asked by I was asked by a reporter, "Is there somebody who you'd want to be?" And I said, "Well, I don't want to be anybody. I want to be Travis McRae, but I would like to have Paul Watson say one day, you know, that Travis McRae is a pretty good guy." So <laughs> that, that's and I'm also Peter just told me that I I'm probably going to be the um, communications officer on one of your ships. So I I have no problem dying in your name. <laughs> You Not ran, in your name, but in, in the environment under you, your command. You ran for Vancouver Center? Yes, I did. You and I have that in common. I ran for MP for Vancouver Center. We both lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, yeah, my real question is, I've noticed that, especially with a lot of the young people, um, we don't have balls anymore. I mean, I think that's it. I mean, there, I mean, people are not standing up mm -hmm. and going out and standing up for what they believe in. As much as they used to, at least, you know, I look at the, the videos of the 60s and everybody going out, what, okay, what is your opinion on that? Uh, I disagree completely. I mean, if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for the passion and the courage of the individuals uh, that crew my ships, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And, and I've got 2,000 crew applications right now, more than we've ever, ever had. And the hardest part of our, my job on that is saying no to so many people. You know, we, we don't want to, but we just don't have the room. Uh, this last campaign to Antarctica was 88 crew from 23 different nations on three different ships. And uh, the, these are the people who make our organization effective. Uh, and, and I'm seeing more and more young people are getting involved, uh, more so I would say than in the 70s or, or the 80s. So I, I completely take a different view on that, really. I think that there's a much more involvement, and, and, and I'm very optimistic about that. Can I just add to that, too? I think it's um, the world's changed. I mean, people used to take to the streets perhaps more visibly than people do now, uh, and that was more effective then, and, and the world has changed and become much more sophisticated. So now I think there's far more room and for people and young people to use the internet, to use, <coughs> YouTube, to use all these things that didn't exist 30 years ago to spread a social, social message. And I think there's lots of people doing that that are inspired by people like Paul and Sea Shepherd. So it's just different, the playing field is different. One of the things that, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly criticized because of, of the way we do things and everything, but the reality of it is, is that in the entire history of our organization, we've never injured anybody. We've never had anybody seriously injured. We've never actually committed a felony or been convicted of a felony crime. 
you know, two years ago, I gave, I was invited to give a lecture to the FBI Academy in Quantico, of all things. And they actually paid me to come lecture the FBI. <laughs> and one of the FBI agents said, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty damn fine line when it comes to the law. <laughs> and I said, well, who cares how fine it is as long as you don't cross the line. So they couldn't disagree with that logic. But one of them said, well, you know, people come into Sea Shepherd and they learn how to be eco-terrorists. You know, there's some of your ex-crew members have gone on to be eco-terrorists, whatever that is. Uh, I don't think they're working for British Petroleum, but anyway. The, uh, <laughs> but I said, so how am I responsible for what people do when they leave Sea Shepherd? You train them, you're responsible. I said, okay, I have three names for you. Lee Harvey Oswald, Timothy McVeigh, and Osama Bin Laden. You train them, you're responsible. Yeah. Actually, three of them joined. This one guy. <laughs> I don't know if that's to keep tabs on us or not. Hi, Paul. Hi. I'm here. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Um, <laughs> do you still live in uh, Gig Harbor? Never did live in Gig Harbor. Oh, where, where did, uh, uh, Friday. Friday, Friday. Friday, Friday. Are you still there? Uh, about two weeks a year. <laughs> oh, well, you're our national treasure, despite DFO. Um, question, uh, where do we stand on the seal hunt, and, or Sea Shepherd stance on the seal hunt? The is, Canadian, is it a real black mark in our country? The Canadian seal hunt, for all intents and purposes, is, is over. Uh, there's no market. Europe has banned, the seal pelts are banned, or China just banned seal pelts. But Canada just can't let it go. So this idiot who runs DFO with Gail Shea, whatever Gail it is. Shea, yeah. Shea, yeah. She just set the quota at 460,000, the highest quota in the history of the seal hunt. Absolutely ridiculous. What was that all about? Thumbing their nose at Europe. It's a bunch of kindergarten guys that are in there just fighting with each other. It's ridiculous. But how many seals are going to be killed this year? Maybe 50, 60,000, which is a lot, but still a lot less the quota because there's no money in it. We have effectively destroyed the market. And that is the only language anybody understands is uh, profit and loss. Now the one thing, the government wants us to go back in there, but we're not doing it because they know that if we go back in there, it will just rile up everybody and all this national patriotism and everything and let's go kill a seal in order to piss off Sea Shepherd. We're not going to do it. The seal hunt is dying and we're going to let it die. Now we're going to pay our, uh, turn our attentions to trying to stop the slaughter of seals in Namibia. So that's what we're, we'll be doing for now. But I think that within a couple of years, it'll die out a natural death. After, you know, and they will no longer have seal stew in the parliament buildings and Harper won't be walking around with a silly little seal skin briefcase and everything. Uh, you know, and you don't have the governor general eating raw seal hearts on television like, you know, some sort of barbarian princess. You know, I mean, the thing is getting... You know, Canada's just been really crazy on this, but I think it'll, I think we'll grow up. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing to that. Um, I cut about an hour out of the film that was all about the seal hunt. Because <laughs> at one time it was much, much longer. But um, two things. Um, Elizabeth May said that she felt that the seal hunt was the biggest distraction away from the decimation of the cod fishery. And that's why the, the Canadian government pursues it, is to keep both fisher people and activists focused on the seal hunt and not thinking about or focusing their attention on the decimation of one of the greatest fish species on the planet, which I thought was very astute. And then I was interviewing um, a guy uh, who's in charge of PR for the, for the DFO about the seal hunt. And when I asked him, I said, well, don't you see that the role of activists, because they have, they're sort of, you know, vociferously against people like Paul or anyone who opposes a seal hunt and in fact kind of hate them. And I said, well, don't you see that the social function of an activist is to create change, to create social change, and that that activists have actually caused you to change your, your approach to the seal hunt and try to make it more humane. Otherwise, you never would have cared, because now they run around saying, well, it's humane, it's humane. And the guy turned to me and he goes, you know, I never actually thought of that that way. And that, to me, was one of the reasons why I wanted to make this film, is I, don't, I think people have forgotten the... The, so, the importance of and the social function of activists yeah, like Paul oh. Watson. So. One conversation that uh, we had out in the ice with the Coast Guard actually was very funny. Uh, I said to the Coast Guard, what are you doing out here? And they said, well, we're protecting the fishermen from people like you, sir. <laughs> I said, well, who's protecting the seals? 
And the guy came back and he said, I understand that's your jobs. <laughs> Thank you. On that note, um, we're going to have to wrap it up because we're out of time and we have another movie right after this and there's a lineup starting. So, but on that note, Paul, thank you very much. Trish, thank you very much. Can I, can, you guys. can I say one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. One more thing. Uh, one more thing. I'd just like to say that um, I, I'd like to just recognize uh, the one person who means more to me than anybody else on, <coughs> and, and who stood by me, and, and that's my daughter, Lily Alani.